Oh, this is what we uh, mean by found. It's a miserable life. And it has different philosophers that are existentialists. Uh, Nietzsche, Sartre, Schopenhauer. And it says, it's a miserable life. Christmas is dead and we have killed it. And this will make sense in a little bit because Nietzsche is the one who says God is dead, right? So he's the one that makes that claim. So this is kind of a, a play on that. So there's secular and there's religious existentialists, okay? So they're not all atheists, they're not all just, there's religious and there's secular. Okay, the religious ones are Sartre, Kierkegaard, uh, Marcel, and Tillich. They're the, they're the main religious existentialists. Now I'll be getting into this a little bit with this what the distinctives are of a religious existentialist. Then there's the secular existentialist, Nietzsche, Sartre, uh, I think it was Niels Brown's, uh, uh, I almost think. Camus. Camus, yeah. I knew it, was, I knew it wasn't typical, I, I forgot to look it up again. Uh, Camus. So these are the, uh, the, the secularists, you have the religious ones. So it's not all just a bunch of atheists that are existentialists, there's actually religious ones too. So Kierkegaard's religious stage, okay? So Kierkegaard bases his religious stage on the model of Abraham when he was going out to sacrifice Isaac, right? So this is his whole, whole basis on it is, and this is where it relates to existentialism and um, this idea of trying to be humanistic centered, personal centered, is that for, for existentialists who are religious like Kierkegaard, it's important that that we we receive our own revelation of God. Okay, so we're not necessarily making the Bible our ultimate authority. We're making our own personal revelation from God our ultimate authority. Okay, so God told me to do X, and I'm going to do X. Okay, um, and He bases this all on the commandment, the divine, divine command to Abraham. Okay, and He says this ultimately leads to this idea of uh, beyond good and evil. We have individuals beyond good and evil. This is a common theme within the, uh, you know, Nietzsche wrote a book, Beyond Good and Evil. This beyond good and evil is a theme within the, the existentialist. So the religious existentialist is, um, believes in God, but believes in kind of a personal God. We each have our own personal experience with God. And God tells us each personally what, how we should live our life. So it's more persons, again, person-centered, religion. So existentialism and humanism, though, is this idea of, it's a humanistic philosophy, um, and this is from Thomas Flynn's book, Existentialism, a very short introduction. So I just got this from, from his, his uh, book last year when I read it. And um, you see here, it says that there's a value hierarchy, right? And ultimately, um, you know, the value is in freedom, like the possibility of choices that we have to make. And so, for, for an existentialist, they're going to be both against the kind of the religious hierarchy, religious um, values, but also they're going to be against like the Marxists. So they're going to be kind of, both of them, they're seen as being bad things from an existentialist point of view. Why? Because it limits our freedom of choice. So this is Nietzsche's quote, okay, that I referred to earlier in that meeting. It says, God is dead, God remains dead, and we have killed him. Yet his shadow still looms. How shall we comfort ourselves, the murderers of all murderers? What was holiest and mightiest of all that all, all that the world has yet owned has bled to death under our knives? Who will wipe the blood off of us? What water is there for us to clean ourselves? So what, what Nietzsche's saying there is that, you know, we as, you know, he's talking about the, the society, he killed God, right? This idea of God. The Christian God. It's not just the general theism. It's just a, he's talking about a Christian God. We killed him. And one of the things that Nietzsche's known for saying is that, well, then we don't want to go and like pick the pockets of God and take morality and other things. We have to create our own morality now. Now that God's dead, we have to provide our own meaning to life, right? So this is another uh, meaning. Where am I going? What am I doing? What is the meaning of life? So what is the meaning of life according to an existential worldview. Well, as you see, it's, it's very person-centered. It's very uh, centered on the individual. And again, this is from uh, Thomas J.J. Altsizer. Um, he was a very popular, he became very popular in the 1960s Death of God movement, okay? But I think this is a very honest quote from him. It says, with the full and final actualization of ultimate death, 
all innocence disappears. Every possible historical return is ended. Transcendence does not simply vanish, but becomes ultimately alien. And a new total nothingness is everywhere. For the death of God is inseparable from the advent of a truly new and even total nihilism. Nihilism, again, is, is uh, I don't think I mentioned what nihilism is. Nihilism is the belief that um, every, there's total meaninglessness, nothingness, there's no meaning to the world, no, there's no ultimate value in anything. So true, uh, a new true des desert and abyss, a nihilism that Nietzsche uh, knows as a consequence of Christianity in consequence of the uniquely Christian God, that God who alone has, has made possible and necessary our ultimate events. So this is a, a uh, existentialist, who's a secularist, an atheist, who's staying, being very honest about what happens when we abandon the Christian God. The result is a nothingness, right? The result is this ultimate abyss, as he says. So another mean, hand over your mo all your money uh, or I'll explain the absurdity of all human activity. So that's like the existential threat. He's dressed as a, a French philosopher, which is kind of the typical uh, view of what exist an existentialist is. You know, kind of that, that's the, the, the typical um, uh, thinking of what an existentialist looks like. So, now we've kind of kind of brought about some of the aspects of, of existentialism. Existentialism, the point of, of you know meaning in and of itself, we have to provide meaning to our lives. Okay. Now, when it comes to uh, the value of life, the meaning of life from an evolutionary existentialist view, this is what um, is said here. It says um, this is again David Frosch, evolutionary existentialist, existentialism, social biology, and meaning of life. It says human beings define themselves give themselves meaning, and establish essence only via their existence. And human beings have no essence independent of the existence and specifics of how they choose to live. So our choices in life define who we are as humans. Uh, we live in a huge universe that's devoid of purpose and uncaring about people. We give meaning to our life by the free, conscious, and deliberate choices so what they're saying here is that really the only meaning that we get is by the choices we make every day in life. Okay, the choices we make to, to, in our life is the only meaning. There's no ultimate meaning in our life. Everything's ultimately uh, life is meaningless. But that's okay. We have to provide our own meaning, right? Uh, so that's what that is. So this is a, another meaning. Uh, nobody exists on purpose. Nobody belongs anywhere. Everybody is going to die. Come have a beer. This is uh, another quote on existence, existence precedes essence, which has been you know, the primary theme of existentialism. It says, what is meant here by saying that existence precedes essence? It means, first of all, man exists, turns up, appears on the scene, and only afterwards defines himself. If man, as the existentialist conceives him, is um, indefinable, it is because at first he is nothing. Only afterwards will he be something. And he himself will have uh, will have made what he will be. So again, very person-centered, very uh, individualistic. We are nothing until we start making choices and choose what we want to do with our life. Then we become something. Other than that, we're nothing. So again, this is a kind of another funny meme. Kierkegaard borrowing from <coughs> Descartes. There, uh, I think, therefore I am. I am, therefore. You know, this is kind of a, a funny take on it. Uh, freedom of choice and responsibility, okay? Man is condemned to be free. That's a very important phrase to existentialism. We're condemned to be free because once thrown into the world, man is responsible for everything he does. It's up to you to give life a meaning. So it's up to you to give your life a meaning. Life's meaninglessness and there's nothing there. We're condemned to be free. And another quote. Better to die on one's feet than to live on one's knees. Freedom is what we do with what is done to us. So very free, freedom of choice is very uh, paramount to the existentialist worldview. 
So, time is of the essence. The, the meaning of life is to give life. I mean, another meaning. Death, my existentialist angst, is suffocating my ability to enjoy existence. And the dad says, read some Kierkegaard. But dad, I'm only four, and read some Nietzsche. Obviously, it's probably right for Four-year-olds will be able to read Nietzsche. Um, existentialism goes to a freedom of responsibility and choice, so much a libertarian free will. So libertarian free will, and this is something that, uh, that's a debate within theology, is whether God created us autonomous and with libertarian free will or not. And he created us independent of himself. Um, and that view of libertarian free will is very similar uh, to this existentialism, this existentialism, we create our choice. The only difference is, is that they do believe um, they're, they'd be one of the more religious um, theistic ones. And most of them do actually believe in the authority of scripture. So, so they're trying to derive from scripture themselves. But I do think there's a very similar uh, contrast, between the, a similarity between existentialism on the one hand and libertarian free will on the other hand. Um, I wanted to mention that. So ethical considerations. The choice of authenticity, so that's very important to be authentic. Authenticity appears to be a moral decision. That's, uh, sorry. And that's, that's the, it becomes the topic of good faith versus bad faith, okay? Living in good faith versus living in bad faith. So, Sartian notions of bad faith is widespread notion of self-deception. Deceiving ourselves is a notion of neglecting our openness to be, and instead of going with the flow, just going with what society's doing and kind of just going with the flow, not really making choices for ourselves. Uh, to live off, uh, inauthentically is to do as they do, like a society is telling us. It's very counter-cultural, counter very go against the grain of what society is doing. We make our own choices. Uh, so, there are two forms of bad faith for, uh, for sorry. The first form of bad faith is um, this uh, various forms of, of determinism that are out there. The Freudian notion, the psychology, or Marxist um, economic theory. Those are both two forms of bad faith that, that, that existentialists would be against, okay? Because, again, it's about freedom, living in our freedom. And if, if we're living in a Marxist society, we don't have freedom of choice. So um, the, that's the first one. The first form is these different ideas that, that think that we're completely determined to, to live life uh, a certain way, and we don't have freedom. The other form of, of bad faith is, um, it says, dis, uh, discounting our antecedent condition, living as though we are pure possibility without an actuality. The quintessential daydreamer who does not live in reality. The person is always daydreaming. And I point to uh, uh, The Secret Life of Walter Mitty. So in The Secret Life of Walter Mitty, he's always daydreaming. He's always living in this other fantasy world. He's not living in the real world. So he's always, he's always, you know, here he's eating lunch, but he's daydreaming. He's on this mountain. He's he always has this adventure he's daydreaming about. Um, but he's not actually living in the real world. And that's considered living in bad faith for an Because we're not actually making choices in the real world, we're just living in a fantasy world. So, good faith according to Sarah. Let's get good, good news, right? Good news, the gospel according to existentialism. <laughs> the good news is that we must realize what it means to be. We must realize what it means to exist. Experiencing our contingency, the resolution to live by my being unto death. So I'm going to live until I die. I'm going to live my life the way I want to live it until I die. Okay, so according to the, the socio-biological existentialism, um, the sole purpose is to pass on our needs. So according to, to, to um, the biological method, evolutionary method, our model, our sole purpose is in existence is to live, to put on our, to pass on our genes, okay? To pass on, to have children to pass on our genes to. 
other than passing out one's own genes, there is no meaning, purpose, and there's no right or wrong. It's just blind, pitiless indifference. So that's the, the uh, evolutionary model. So existentialism philosophers like Kierkegaard, Nietzsche, Sartre, uh, they encourage people to rebel against their, uh, this, this per their, pers and their personal lives. So with this, they would, in this example here, our society pushes this idea of the social uh, biological evolutionary model, right? That we're purpose, our only purpose is to pass on our genes. Well, from an existentialist point of view, we must rebel against that, okay? Not have children, not pass on our genes. We, want, we don't wanna live in bad faith like these, these evolutionary people want to. We need to rebel against that and live counterculture. So, Evolutionary existentialists. There are evolutionary existentialists out there. Okay, let us grant, if only for our argument, that human beings, like other living beings, are merely survival machines for their genes. Uh, robots whose mandated purpose is neither more or less than the propagation of their genes. If so, then there is no more inherent meaning to life, as seen in evolutionary terms, than viewed by the existentialists. So what they're saying is, there's really, you know, there's no purpose to life. Okay. We're just saying that, that we're no different. We're just like robots passing, you know, trying to keep the, the humanity to uh, keep going. But there's really no difference between that, passing on genes, and living according to the existentialist law. Essentially, they're both the same. Why not be an existentialist? Um, so this is Nano the cat. So she, she wants to be a cat. Okay. So how can Nano the cat, a 20-year-old human female who believes she is the wrong species, exist in good faith? Like Nano the cat, she's a human, 20-year-old female, but she believes that she is the wrong species, she's a cat. So what about family society? Remember, countercultural, she doesn't want to, she's not going to do what her family tells her to do, not going to do what society tells her to do, she's a cat, she's going to live with cat. What about the essence of humanity? Existence precedes essence. She chooses to be a cat, she's welcome to be a cat. That's what existen that's kind of a, so I want to put existentialism on trial, okay? So 9-11, I know a lot of you were maybe born around that time. You, run, you don't remember 9-11, okay? But what happened was there's these planes that were um, crashed into these buildings, the, the Twin Towers, and um, these events were done by militant religious um, um, extremists who believe God was telling them to do this, okay? From an existentialist point of view, though, they were living in good faith. You cannot say they were living in bad faith. We must accept that the events of 9-11 were done in good faith, from an existential point of view. So that, that event, from an existential point of view, because they have that independent personal revelation of God, they're trying to obey their own personal life. They're making their choices they're living in good faith, okay? As long as they're doing that, they're living in good faith. So, as I end the comments about existentialism, okay, those are your eyes on cocaine, those are your eyes on marijuana, those are your eyes on existentialism, on existentialism. So we're gonna move here from this, because I think you'll see that existentialism does not provide any hope beyond this life. The only hope is we have to make the best choice we can in the life we live now. So there is no eschatology, personal eschatology in existentialism. We're just living for the here and now. So eschatology, the term eschatology, is a combination of two great words. Uh, eschatos meaning last things or last, and logia meaning word or discourse. So it's literally the study of last things, okay? And there's cosmic eschatology, the whole world of the human race. And there's personal eschatology. What is going to happen to you when you die? Your personal, individual destiny as a human being after death. So this is where we're getting to the gospel message, okay? Um, the gospel provides the antithesis to the, the meaninglessness of existentialism, okay? So every worldview 
and said that every worldview has an eschatology. Now, existentialism makes it all about the here and now. So their, their eschatology is very weak. Um, and the Christian worldview, the future is based upon our hope in the second coming of Jesus Christ. Now, personal eschatology then, as existentialism, there is no future existence apart from what we live now. Just the here and now. With Christianity, everyone will be judged by God. So we have a personal, um, so I want to provide a video on the gospel. The gospel is about the glory of God. It's the story of God's redemption, of saving sinful, unwanted people. The story that begins before the world began. The story of us, God who created us, man, in the garden, in perfect fellowship with him, unstained by rebellion, brokenness, and sin. We fall entered into God's creation, and God does something that is unexpected. Rather than doing what God should do, could do, because he's holy, God promises to save. He doesn't come in and simply bring the curse, but he promises first the Messiah, the woman's seed, who will come in and through this work, the woman's seed will crush the head of the serpent and be bruised on his heel. It is a story of God's grace flowing through history. It's a story that God tells in vivid detail, in high definition about the Messiah. Long before Jesus ever walked on the earth in his earthly ministry, God told us every detail necessary to know Jesus as Savior and as Lord. The story is God coming to save, Isaiah 9, verses 6 through 7. A son is coming, a child is coming. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, El Gibor, which is an exclusive name of God, the Mighty God. Father of eternity. The Bible says that the increase of his government and of peace there will be no end. The Bible tells us when he's coming in Daniel chapter 9 that he'd be cut off before the destruction of the second temple. The Bible tells us about his life and ministry that he would, Isaiah 53, be wounded for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities, be chastised for our peace to be upon him, and by his wounds we be healed. He'd be pierced through for our transgressions, that he would be numbered among the transgressors, that he would be the one that would justify the many as he would bear our iniquities. He'd be counted among the rebels, the Bible tells us. But, but that's not all. That's not. The Bible tells us that this Messiah is coming. He's coming to bring salvation and forgiveness, that he would redeem us from our sins, but there's more. He would actually be coming to bring kingdom, his rule in history. Daniel 7, verses 13 through 14, Daniel sees this vision, and he says, Behold, coming on the clouds of heaven, one like a son of man, and that he came up to the ancient of days, was presented before him, and to him were given dominion, glory, and kingdom, that all the peoples, nations, and men of every language might serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which will not pass away, and his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. This Messiah was coming to bring a kingdom that would bring the knowledge of God throughout the earth like the water that covered the sea. And the most popular verse in the New Testament is drawn from the Old, is Psalm 110, that this Messiah must reign until all of God's enemies are placed under his feet as a footstool for his kingdom he would have victory, that this Messiah would bring forgiveness and salvation through his death and resurrection, and that the, his rule would extend to the ends of the earth, bringing the nations to God. That's where we're at now. The good news of forgiveness and salvation, eternal life, only in Christ and what he has accomplished. We are wretches. We are miserable sinners. We are so rebellious against God that if possible, we would spit at the very fire. That's our condition. And God loves sinners so much that he took upon himself flesh, lived the sinless life that we have not, died the death that we should die, was buried and rose again. 
he is ascended and seated, and he calls men everywhere to repent, to turn from darkness to light to God, to trust in this Messiah for forgiveness and salvation. That's the call of the gospel. But listen, this gospel is not just about my salvation only. It's the gospel of about God rescuing sinners, redeeming the sinful, and bringing his rule to the ends of the earth, reversing what happened in the garden, fighting the curse as far as it's found, and destroying it. And then Jesus returns in final victory after all God's enemies have put in their feet. God, Jesus the Messiah, conquering death. God taking what man did in the world and reversing it to his glory. That's the story of this Messiah. And you can know him. You can know him by turning from sin and trusting in Christ and in his work alone. Abandoning sin, abandoning self-righteousness, and coming to this Messiah for redemption and the gift of eternal life that God has offered. The Bible says, turn and sin. That's the call of the gospel. It's giving